Okay, welcome back to the workshop on pedagogy for effective use of ICT in engineering education. This session is called learning objectives, what, why and how. This session will be run in flipped mode as I had mentioned in the earlier session on setting expectations. We will start off by a short video on the content of why learning objectives. Watch the video, we will tell you exactly how to do that and you need to pause the video when you get instructions on which are there in the video itself on where to pause it. At that point we will do an activity and this cycle, this alternate cycle of watch video do activity we will continue for the entire session. So let me just hand over the mic to Jai Krishnan. We will start the first video. So good morning everyone. Uh, the first session itself is on developing learning objective. So learning objectives, what is learning objective, why we want to create learning objective and how to create learning objective. These are the sessions conducted here. So I am Madhuri Marvin Kurve, faculty from Thakur College of Engineering and uh, research scholar at Education Technology along with my guide Sahana Murthy. We are conducting the sessions on development of learning objective. After completion of this session, what we expect you to do is, you will able to explain what is learning objective or need for learning objective. You can identify what is valid learning objective and you will able to write learning objective for the course what you are taking for the next semester. So now as a teacher, what we expect student to learn? Definitely first is the content that is the course whichever course you are teaching, whatever is the important concept, whatever the important concept applications, all these things you feel that student should able to learn through your courses. But along with the content what we expect is some skills should be developed in the student or some abilities should be developed in the student. Now this abilities can be complex problem solving abilities, maybe designing of the experiment, maybe making some predictions or how to check solutions. So these are certain abilities we expect student to do once they study the course. And the third point is attitude. What is all engineering about? If there is an open problem, how to attain that problem? So these are all attitudes student need to develop after learning the course. So these are, as a teacher, these are our expectations. So now imagine a teaching learning scenario. The course is digital logic design, topic is VSDL, it is a simulation language for digital circuit design and students are from second year engineering, electronics engineering. Now this is just a brief refresher on the digital logic design or digital logic circuit, what it contains basically. Digital logic circuit is an electronic device wherein decision, logical decisions are made by the device depending upon different digital input signal which are given at the input. Now for example, this is the NOT gate where the symbol is shown here. Now what NOT gate does is it just inverses the input signal that is if you give a positive signal, you will get a negative signal from the gate. So such three basic types of gates are in a digital logic circuit. So this is a very basic introduction of the logic circuit. This is just a refresher for all those they know what is the logic circuit and those, those they are not knowing what is the logic circuit as a course. Now this logic gates they can be tested using a signal practically that is hardware is possible you mount it you test it. The second method is you can test it even using a simulation language that is you can simulate that gate apply different signals through test bench and see what is the output. Now in order to do this there is a simulation software which is available that is known as VHDL. VHDL is very high speed hardware description language wherein you are describing that logic circuit, you apply different different signals and you taste the signal. So now let us come back to the teaching learning scenario. Now teaching learning scenario is this is this VHDL is the part of a digital logic system which is taught by a teacher. Now when teacher is teaching the subject, it is being a small unit, what is done by teacher is teacher explain all instruction set of VHDL in the class. 
explain all the commands with example and wrote few programs for standard circuit. So, this is what is done by teacher. Now, let us see what student had done. So, students studied whatever is taught, whatever commands are taught to them in VHDL, whatever problems solved by teacher in the classroom that practice same problems at home. Now, let us see what happened in exam. Now, this is the exam question. Exam question is related to some real life scenario, switches are given and on off conditions are given to the student and they are supposed to simulate the situation using VHDL. So, what is expected from student here, they are supposed to analyze that situation, convert that situation into logic gate and then use VHDL program and implement VHDL program. This is what is a simple expectation from the exam. Now, let us see what happened. Result is most of the students were not able to attempt this question or solve this question. Now, let us see what is wrong. So, when feedback is taken, student clear cut said that this question is out of syllabus because they have not solved it, they have not come across any real life situation, they have solved problems with very standard gates and VHDL being very small part of the entire syllabus, teacher treated in the way it is given in the syllabus. So, now instructor comment is. See this question is very simple, they have to just apply logic and they have to solve the problem, VHDL commands are known to them. So, now this is what is the teaching learning scenario. Most of the time as a teacher we also come across this situation. We know that the questions are simple, but students feel that they are out of syllabus. So, uh, that is the end of video 1, you can respond back in the chat. So. Uh, I see lots of yeses, uh, two no's till now. So now I am going to the next video. Here it says that it is an activity called Think Pair Share. Think Pair Share is another active learning strategy. So we will do this and you will be exposed to what this particular strategy is. So, now we are going to play video 2. So, what we like you to do here is an activity in the format uh, of what is called think pair share. So, this activity has three phases. In the first phase, the think phase, what each participant, what each of you need to do is come up with one possible reason as to what went wrong and write it in your notebook. So, there is two minutes for this phase, write it in your notebook, there is nothing to be done uh, on AVU or so yet. As soon as the two minutes are over, we will uh, put up the instructions for the next phase. So, let the think phase start right now. Write what went wrong uh, in your notebook. No discussion at this point. We will give you opportunity for discussion in a few, in two minutes exactly. So, this has to be done as an individual activity. Please write the answer in your notebooks. Coordinators, please just see that everybody is writing the answer to this question in their notebooks. So, I have posted the think phase. So, this is this activity is the think phase activity. So, you saw in the earlier video that there were some comments made by the instructors and students within your remote center. Think individually first, think individually first and come up with one possible reason on what went wrong and write it in your notebook. You have one more minute to write what went wrong. So, participants just at your remote center individually write what went wrong. Now, we will move to the next video which will have instructions on the pair phase of this activity. I would like to remind all of you that there is no single correct answer in this question. So, because of that, uh, what you next need to do is to turn to your neighbor. So, this is the pair phase of the activity where you turn to your neighbor and discuss your reason with your neighbor. 
and the neighbor will do the same. So share your reasons with each other. This is the phase where you can actually talk to your neighbor. And together, come up with which is a stronger reason. So since there may be multiple valid answers, this is a good time to find out what other possible answers are and collectively see what is really happening in this scenario. So let's take about four or five minutes for this phase. Some of you have written on chat window that the question was not very clear. So let me just summarize what you're supposed to do. We first set up a scenario between a student and a teacher where the teacher taught something in class and gave a question in the exam. So what the teacher taught in class was about a logic gate. And uh, what the question was uh, is there on this slide. The exam question was as given in the slide, where it says that a staircase light is controlled by two switches and simulate this situation using VHDL. And the actual logic gates were taught in class. So what happened here was that the students did poorly in the exam, and they said that the question was out of syllabus. And the teacher said, the question is simple, since the students already know the truth table for gates, and they just have to apply the logic. So what you are supposed to do with this scenario is discuss with your neighbor why this mismatch has happened. Why, why did this problem happen between the student and the teacher? So this is the pair phase of the activity where you are discussing with your neighbor on the reason for why the, there's a problem between the student and the teacher. So what you have done right now is pairing between the groups within the remote center. So we'll now move to the sharing phase. Watch this video and carefully follow the instructions. So if you have discussed the answer with your neighbor, now let's move to the third phase, where together as a center or as a class, you come up with a strong, a really strong reason, share your answers with the other people in the class. And the way we'll do this phase is that e each pair uh, can share your strong reason with uh, the remote center coordinator and with the other participants. So you can speak up. There'll be a sh so this is a short open discussion session within each remote center. Coordinators, your role right now is to moderate the discussion first. So let a few pairs or all pairs, if you have a few people, share their reasons. And then your role, your responsibility is to share the top two reasons from your center via the AU chat. So let your participants tell you, let the pairs tell you what they came up with. And you can pick the two most frequent ones or the two strongest ones and share it on the chat window. And finally, we'll summarize the answers from all the different centers uh, once we take over again. So you can spend about five minutes doing a discussion, a moderation within your center, and then you can share it. So we are seeing lots of answers. So there is an answer which says that problem set was not defined and conveyed properly. Students were not able to apply the concept for real practice application. So the remote center coordinators share the top two reasons. Both are right. Lecture was not interactive from one remote center. OK, so let's look at some of the chat uh, responses that are coming. One common response that's coming is that the teacher has not done any examples in the class. And in the exam, directly the students got an example. Some other responses that are coming is that students, that there is a gap between the theory and the practice. So what was taught in class was some sort of theoretical knowledge. And what was given in the exam was practical knowledge. Let me read a couple of more common uh, responses that are coming. And then we will go to the resolution of this problem. So yeah, the most common one, that the response that is coming is that the students are not able to relate the theory to the uh, application. And there is one response we have is which says that the students were not aware of how they will be evaluated. So all these are actually fairly important reasons. So let's do one thing. Let's look at the next video and try to analyze why this problem actually happened. So we are starting the next video now. This is video five. If we summarize it, what we can say 
as to what went wrong in the teaching learning scenario. So now we are moving to the next, uh, next part of this session. Let's summarize the activity. That the teacher and the exam setters had some expectations. And the students had their own expectations and they have their own level of learning. And there is some mismatch between the two. So what we did so far in this activity is that we wanted to try to get this point, uh, try to come to the point of a mismatch between the two. In the next slide, we'll try to see how to solve this mismatch. And the way we ran this activity, now I'd, I'd like all of you to think from a teacher's perspective for a few minutes. There was an open question as to what was wrong with the scenario and we wanted all the participants to discuss answers to this question. Typically what we would do in a traditional classroom is simply ask the question and one or two people would raise their hand and say, okay, here is an answer. But when we do that, the class is not participatory enough and I think one of you has even written that in your reasons. So to get all students to be engaged in a certain activity, in a certain teaching learning activity. And to get a highly participatory class, there is a method called think pair share. That's the one we just did, wherein we split the activity into two fa three phases, uh, exactly like the way we did. In the first phase, uh, each participant or each student has to write an answer. In the second phase, they discuss with the neighbor. And in the third phase, they come together as a class and do it. So splitting it and staggering the activity into these three phases ensures that everybody is committed, everybody's answer gets heard, and everybody has a way to listen to each other's answers also. So we'll come back to this technique several times in uh, these sessions over these three days. OK, so let me hand the mic back to Madhuri, and she'll now discuss some possible solutions for this mismatch. So now. We have seen that there is a mismatch between teacher or examiner's expectation and what is the student level of learning. So we need to match this and how can we match this? So in order to match this, the solution is I have to clearly spell as a teacher what are my goals as a teacher. What I want my students to take away when I complete a class. So keeping these goals and objectives in mind, we define learning objectives, wherein learning objectives will give clear idea what is my expectation as a teacher and where students will fall in this expectation or how I will train student to that label. So I need to define learning objectives. So let us see the definition of learning objective. Learning objectives are basically goal statements which includes specific measurable performance outcome of the learner. So we have to underline this word specific measurable performance outcome of the learner. Now let us recall the same digital logic circuit. These are the gates which are decision making devices and I already gave an example of NOT gate. So what is the learning objective for this topic? So if I want to define learning objective for basic gate, I will define it as students will be able to write truth table of a not gate. This can be one of the learning objective. The second learning objective can be students will be able to write code for in VHDL for a not gate. So these are some examples of learning gate. So here specific measurable performance I am taking. So when I define learning objective, what I am measuring here specifically is they will able to write a truth table. So simple expectation is here or simple specific measurable outcome is if they write a truth table for not get, that is a measurable outcome and student should able to do it. So accordingly, I will teach them in the classroom. In second case, they will able to write VHDL code. So here what all things are expected, they should know what is not get. What, it is, what is a truth table? So this is a measurable performance and then they should able to convert it into code. So this is also another measurable performance for a given learning objective. So here measurable performance is they will able to write a code for the NOT gate. So this is very specific and it is measurable as well. Uh, one more thing that uh, you can notice is 
each of these learning objectives starts with students will be able to do something. Students will be able to write. Students will uh, write a truth table or students will be able to write a code. And why we start it like that is if you go back to the definition, the learning objective has to have or has to say what is the performance outcome of learner. And what performance outcome means is it should be, it should say what the student should be able to do. So performance is something that is demonstrable, something that the student actually can do. So along with specific and measurable, a learning objective is written in such a way that you have to think about what exactly the student can do or what student should do after the teaching. That's why all learning objectives start with the phrase, students will be able to write the truth table. So now you've seen this definition. I think it's worthwhile copying this definition into your notebook for a moment because the next activity which we have actually uh, is an application of this definition. In the previous activity, we saw that giving concepts and definition is not sufficient and immediately a teacher has to do some examples where it's applied. So now, right now, we are the teachers. So what we'll do is take this definition and we'll pose an activity based on this definition. So I'll pause on this slide for about 30 seconds, write down this and then I'll pose the activity. Okay, so let's summarize what all we did till now. In the last 10 minutes or so, there were several questions that we posed in various formats and you wrote down the answers to those questions both individually and you responded to those questions in pairs. The RC coordinator summarized the response and sent us the, your uh, class response over the chat window. So this activity that we've done in the last 10 minutes goes by the name of Think, Pair, Share. This is a very powerful active learning strategy that all of you as teachers can use in your own classes whether they are technical classes or classes on any other courses on any other topic, whenever there is a somewhat open-ended problem that you want your students to solve or when there is a question you want them to think about, when you want your students to think about, which has multiple solutions, multiple valid or possible solutions. So if you recall the question that was posed to you for the Think Pair Share activity just now, the question was, there is a scenario and there is something wrong with the scenario. What's wrong? This is a scenario where it's a fairly open question. It can be analyzed in different ways. Many of those answers are valid. But at the same time, as an entire community, we want to try to narrow down and focus on the solution which actually makes sense. So if you recall in the previous session, we talked about active learning strategies. And Think, Pair, Share or TPS is one such active learning strategy. We will use such strategies a few times during the sessions today and tomorrow. And in tomorrow's lab, in tomorrow afternoon, Tuesday afternoon, you will do an entire lab session on creating Think, Pair, Share activities for your own course. So what we will proceed with now is yet another active learning strategy. And this is similar to the voting strategy. This voting or polling that you're, you've already done, but here we'll do it in a slightly different way. Okay, so please don't answer anything through the chat window yet. Please stop answering through chat. Let me just pose the multiple choice question. Go to the so the question is, which of the following is an appropriate learning objective for the topic of logic gates? And you can use the definition that you copied down that a learning objective is a goal statement which defines specific measurable performance outcomes of the learner. So there are five possibilities here and please answer through the poll once we enable it, which do you think is valid? We have posted the poll, please don't answer through chat but try to do it through poll itself so that we can get a histogram. We get a graph here of the number of people answering various uh, choices. So there were five statements, three statements and two other choices which said all of the above or none of the above. So let's take a look on which is a valid learning objective. Okay, so if you could pause the polling now and 
this activity is not yet over because there is something that uh, I want to interject and intervene at this point. A lot of you have one particular answer in your from your RC. There is a majority answer. I am not telling you which this majority answer is, but what I will tell you is that the majority answer that has come is not correct. So, what I would like you to do is go back to the definition of what a learning objective is. I will put it on the slide again. Learning objective defines specific measurable performance outcome of a learner. So, go through each of the first three statements. Is it specific? Is it measurable? And what I would like you to do is think about this a little bit and maybe vote again in your center. We will do one more round of this poll. I want you to discuss this again with your neighbor, with your entire class and all I am saying is that the earlier answer that you all gave, okay, let me even give you one more hint. Most of you said that all of the above were valid learning objectives, but that is not a right answer. So, discuss amongst yourselves based on the definition of learning objective, which is a valid learning objective. We have restarted the poll and go back to the definition and try to vote again, see whether which of these first three is a specific learning objective. The answer is not all of the above, so you already have a hint. And once we have finished the polling, what we will do is explain this question using uh, the video. Another 15 seconds to poll again. Okay, so let me just tell you what happens in the poll before I play the next video, what, what's happening. In the first poll, out of 144 submissions, in the first poll out of 144 submissions, I would say close to 120 said all of the above was the right answer. After I gave you the hint that look back at the definition, now the results are very broad out of 120 centers that have submitted, we have about 21 saying answer 1, we have 10 saying answer 2, 36 saying answer 3, 16 saying all of the above and 32 saying none of the above. So, the distribution of answers from the learners, from the participants has changed in this active learning strategy, whereas in the first round. I would say 90 percent said all of the above were learning objectives. So, let us watch the video now and see how to understand which is a valid learning objective and which is not a valid learning objective. You have to watch video number 7 which we have started playing just now. It turns out that as you see the answer none of these are valid learning objectives. So, I will let Madhuri explain why this is so. So, what we have seen is whatever written right now here all the three that is they are not valid learning objective. Why they are not valid learning objective? Let us visit to the definition of learning objective. What definition says learning objective includes specific measurable performance outcome of the students. So, now let us see one by one all these learning objectives. The first learning objective is students will be able to understand function of the logic gate. So, now when we say that understand function of the logic gate, it is not a specific measurable outcome. Understanding of function, how are we going to check it? If they are able to draw the circuit is also understanding, if they are able to write to table is also understanding. So, what is a specific measurable outcome when we say that? student will able to understand the function. So, when let us go to the second learning objective, so, student will be able to visualize logic gate. Now, visualization of logic gate, it is difficult to measure, it can be in the form of waveform, it can be in the form of truth table. So, how are we going to measure visualization of logic gate of the students? The third is they will know. So, how you know that students are knowing logic gate, how logic gate works? How are you going to measure that student know how logic gate works? So, for all these three verbs whatever we have used, 
none of them are specific measurable performance outcome of the student and definition says that we want specific measurable outcome of the student which is not fulfilled by any one of this and thus none of the above is the answer for this question that is none of the learning objective written here satisfies definition of learning objective. Uh, this is really an important slide here, so that is why I would like to uh, keep this on for a moment and Madhuri explain why each of these is not a valid learning objective. What I would like you to think about as teachers is if you want to try to measure students understanding, there are various ways in which you might think understanding can be measured. Some of you might ask students to simply say, simply define the quantity. Some of you might ask students to uh, give an example to measure understanding. Others might ask students to draw something to measure understanding. Yet others might give an application problem or a real life problem to measure understanding. So understand actually can stand for a variety of different things. And this is exactly where the mismatch happens as you saw in the teaching learning scenario. That the teacher, according to the teacher, understanding meant solving a real life problem. But according to the students, understanding simply meant knowing the uh, concepts or uh, uh, writing the definition of the concepts. So as a teacher, this word understand is really problematic. It's not at all precise. So what we'll do now is to see how exactly to write learning objectives so that they are specific and measurable. And the other point which you should note here is that none of these are really performance outcomes in the sense, what is it that you want the student to specifically be able to do? You're not trying to find out what's in the student's mind, but you're looking for actions and behaviors of the student. That's what's meant by performance outcome. Let's pause the video here for a minute and do a little bit of reflection of what happened just now. So one thing that you will be expected to do throughout the workshop is alternate your roles between a learner and a teacher. So we all know that you're teachers by profession and in real life, but for purposes of this workshop, often you're in the learner's role or you're wearing a learner hat. And sometimes we'll also ask you to wear your teacher hat. So from a learner's perspective, what you did just now was go through various examples of what is not a learning objective, analyzed or heard an analysis and gave your responses about why something is not a learning objective. And where it's paused right now is to, is at the point where you will learn how to write a learning objective. So I'm going to ask you to now switch hats for one minute or so and assume you're a teacher. What happened in this activity is that there was some misconception about what is a learning objective or what is not a learning objective. So through this multiple choice question, which was very carefully designed to help learners, help the participants bring out this misconception. One round of voting was done when the misconception was elicited. Some hint was given and the participants were asked to discuss with each other. And then a second round of voting was done in which part of the misconception was resolved but not all of it. And finally the instructors, that is us at this end or through the video, we completely analyzed and we resolved the misconception. So through a carefully designed conceptual multiple choice question and its analysis and summary, a specific misconception which is known to exist among learners was brought out as well as resolved. So this entire technique goes by the name of peer instruction. This is yet another active learning strategy and in today's lab in the afternoon, you will be learning on how to, what exactly is peer instruction, how to write your own PI questions, uh, what are the different types of peer instruction questions and so on. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you, request you to go back into your role as a learner and let's now look at how to write a valid learning objective. This is going to be a video. So now let us see how to construct learning objectives. 
Now as a teacher we always start with syllabus. So I have selected one particular topic from the syllabus that is logic gates. Now I have just elaborated what is the content in that particular topic. So logic gate contains basic gates, their functions and truth tables. Then there are some logic expressions, logic diagrams, combination of this logic diagrams and universal gate. So this is the content of the syllabus. So this is always available with us in the syllabus format. So now from the syllabus onwards what is to be defined first? So we have to define first what are possible measurable outcomes for a given topic. So I have defined few of them that student will be able to draw symbols of the basic gate. So that, that can be one of the specific measurable performance outcome that is they will draw symbol that is only expected from students or they will just able to write a truth table if symbol is given to them or gate is mentioned to them they will able to write simply a truth table. Then third can be if a circuit is given to them they can able to show a logic diagram connection diagram or if any practical problem is given to them they will able to convert it into simple logical expression. So here what we are expecting is what is the performance outcome that is measurable performance outcome. So drawing of the symbol you can measure easily. If they write a truth table that is also measurable performance. If they draw a diagram you can look at the diagram you can see the details of the diagram and the diagram itself is a measurable outcome or if they write some logic expression that is also a measurable outcome. So first we need to identify what are measurable performance outcome for a given topic. There can be many outcomes, there can be few outcomes, it is up to teacher that what level you are expecting from the students. So accordingly we have to define first measurable performance outcome. So this is how it is defined and then simply convert them into learning objective. Now when we write learning objective as I mentioned by Sana ma'am you have to write it student oriented. So what student will be able to do? So when I write a learning objective it should be student will be able to draw symbol of given basic gate. So it is student center or learner center and measurable performance outcome. So all the possible measurable outcomes are now converted to learning objective as student will be able to write truth table for a basic gate, student will be able to draw logic diagram, student will be able to draw symbol for a given basic gate. So these are the learning objectives. So what how we started? We started with a simple topic from the syllabus. We noted down or we have listed what are possible performance outcome for a given topic or given module and then we converted them into learning objectives. So what is important in construction of learning objective is you have to select a appropriate action verb. That action verb should able to say what is the performance outcome of a student. It should be specific measurable outcome. So when we are writing learning objective you have to remember that we are not supposed to use this verbs that is understand function of logic gates, visualize logic circuits. They will know how to how logic circuits or logic gates work. Instead what we have to use action verbs like identify, list, student will able to describe, logic diagram, student will able to explain function of logic gate, they will able to solve problem. So they should be specific measurable learning outcomes of a student. So verbs whatever verbs you are using that verb should actually predict or give action or the performance measures of the student that is most important when we are writing learning object. So uh, I hope all of you have understood how to create learning objectives. So what we will do right now is you are already familiar with the peer instruction question. 
you know the definition of uh, what is learning objective so what i am going to do now is another polling question which for which you will have to give answer based on what you learned right now okay the question is posted in the slide which of these is a valid learning objective so participants have to vote your choice and the rc coordinator has to count and let us know the majority choice through a view poll so you will have to give us the majority from your remote center we'll enable the poll in uh, 10 seconds so meanwhile within the remote center please have a look at the choices and answer it so i have enabled the poll do not answer through a view chat answer it in the poll so the question is which of these is a valid learning objective so around 130 centers have uh, responded we have around 50 remote centers actually 60 remote centers saying that it is d none of the above and there is a fair distribution of around 20 for all the other choices we'll now look at what exactly was the correct answer so the correct answer is it is none of the above and the reason for this is that it has to be concerned with the learner that means the student should the learning objective should have been started with the wording student will be able to if you carefully look at these statements all these is from the point of view of a teacher i will give questions i will teach logic circuits show animation so this is what the teacher is going to do this is called an instructional goal but a learning objective as the definition says to be concerned always with the learner and hence have to start always with the student will be able to so what we are saying here is that as a teacher of course we make statements like this that in tomorrow's class i will teach logic circuits using examples we make statements like for next week i need to find an educational animation that explains the function of logic gate so these are very natural and we are not saying that these are wrong and you should not do it definitely have these but if you only do this if you only think from your perspective as to what you will do in class you are likely to have the mismatch that was uh, that happened in the very first scenario where you will explain something in class give some question on the exam and the students will complain saying it's out of, out of syllabus so to make sure that your goals are aligned with students expectations you have to write down student centric learning objectives in addition to goals from the teacher's perspective so what we will do in the last 10 minutes or so of this session is go through one more video two more videos on summary which summarize how to construct learning objectives and then you'll have some homework activities where you will actually uh, homework or in class activities also where you will actually construct some learning objectives all right so here is a big activity that you can do now in your uh, centers so each participant please pair up with a partner and so each participant please pair up with a partner and preferably pair up with a partner who's in the same co uh, subject domain who will be teaching the same course uh, not the same course but who's in the same department as you that will make <coughs> it easier for you to do this activity so you can get up change seats and find a partner who's in the same department or who might be familiar with the same domain as you then together you select the course that you will be teaching this semester or any one course select a specific topic in your syllabus so for example the exam in uh, the example we gave we took the course or the subject of digital logic circuit design and we specifically looked at gates and truth table so choose a narrow topic after you've done all these your task is to write two learning objectives 
for that specific topic. So if you have any questions, you can actually ask questions about this activity. You can ask it on chat. Let's spend about seven or eight minutes on this activity. This is video number nine. Any topic where you both have comfort is fine. So you and your partner should know the t details of the topic. Some of you are asking how to submit these answers. The, and there is no need to submit these answers. Just write it with your partner. And what we will do is a self-assessment of your answers after about five minutes. So there is no need to write anything on chat for this particular activity. Simply write down two learning objectives for a particular topic in a common course that you and your partner teach. So if you're writing learning objectives, please look at the self-assessment. And you can assess your own learning objectives or your partner's learning objectives. And if you feel that you did not write a valid learning objectives based on the two criteria that are on the slide, please revise your learning objectives. So your objective should start with the phrase, the student should be able to. And it should avoid the words understand, know, learn, and so on. Instead, it should have an action verb where students should do something, like draw, write, or calculate, and so on. So we'll just conclude this activity with the self-assessment. There is nothing you need to uh, submit here. So do a self-assessment. If you think they're not valid, revise your learning objectives. Another three minutes for the assessment and revision. There's one last summary we want to do before concluding this session. And in the meantime, let me take two chat questions that came. One question was, is there a difference between a learning objective and a learning outcome? So I'm assuming now that all of you have finished writing and revising and assessing. So I'm just going to answer one or two chat questions, and then we will summarize this entire session. So there are some minor differences based on which definitions you follow between learning objectives and learning outcomes. Usually, objectives are written for some specific topics or some domain-related topics and so on. And outcomes are more generic. Usually, that's the case. But for all practical purposes, you can just assume that both of them are very similar to each other. And I think the reason you're asking this is that many of you have to write down uh, have to follow an outcome-based assessment and have to write outcome-based learning uh, type of statements for your own course. Whatever rules that you learned in this session hold for learning outcomes also. That they must be student-centric. They must be performance-oriented. They should avoid the word understand and know, and so on. A another question that came up is, how many learning objectives should one write? Learning objectives are of various types. They can be less complex or more complex. That's today afternoon session. They can be at a topic level. They can be at a chapter level. They can be at the entire course level. And again, if you're writing objectives for tomorrow's class, one class, something like three, four, five, maybe six is a reasonable number. If you have 12 objectives for one class, you won't be able to address them. Sometimes even one objective is sufficient for a single class. For a course, on the other hand, again, 5 to 10 is a common number. I'm not saying that you should not have more or should not have less. But typically, people write something around that figure for an entire course. So what we'll do to conclude this session is uh, a summary video of learning objectives and how to write them. So coming back to the summary of what we learned today, we have put all the things together. We learned how to write learning objective, considering what are the specific measurable outcome from the given topic. So in order to summarize how these learning objectives are fitting, the same topic I'm continuing with, that is the logic gates basics. First, I will define all these learning objectives. That is, student will be able to draw symbol of logic gates. Student will be able to draw logic diagram for given mathematical expression. Student will identify gate combination for a given real life problem. So with this three, that is, as just now the exercise was given to you to categorize. First, two may be my 
first learning objective for first two or three classes and the last one I will put as the last for the last class of the particular topic. So, this is how I will categorize and then accordingly I will plan my instructions that is in order to fulfill this learning objective what all I should do in the class. So, my lecture plan will be I will explain them gates with symbols with truth table. I will make them practice these things or remember these things recall these things. Then I will show them real life situation some problems I will solve because that is one of the learning objective for me. Similarly, I will draw logic diagram in the classroom, I will tell them to identify mathematical expression, few problems I will solve, few problems I will them to solve. This is how I will make them practice and this is what my entire lesson plan. So, you can see that if I plan my learning objectives in advance, accordingly I will plan each one of my lecture, accordingly I will add on activities in my lecture and my each lecture will be definitely aligned to fulfill this learning objective. So, this is why we need to define learning objective so that our instructional plan will be foolproof. Then once I follow this instruction plan, students also will have same study plan because whatever you do in the classroom, whatever instructions you give in the classroom, accordingly they will practice the symbols, they will solve problem they will take up problems from real life, they will write try to write the gates, they will try to find practice some logic diagram problems using mathematical expressions so and so forth because I have given them a clear cut instructional plan I taught all these things in the classroom the same plan will be followed by students as well. So, this is how we are avoiding mismatch between instructor and student that is instructor's expectation and student level of learning will be match. Now, once I define learning objective and then the third part is the exam. So, once the learning objectives are very clear, the exam questions will be also based on learning objectives because now we are telling that these are the performance outcomes expected from students. So, we need to test them for this performance outcome only. So, accordingly the exam questions will be there. So, this is how learning objective will align your instructor plan, student plan, study plan and exam as well. So, what LO is doing finally? The learning objective is combining teaching plan, student learning and student assessment as well and this is how we can avoid mismatch between teachers expectation and students learning level and we can maintain uniformity across the plans of all the teachers over the university. And similarly, the assessment also or the question assessment questions also will be based on whatever is taught in the classroom. So, that is the summary of uh, session 1. So, we will break now for lunch.